Good morning, my name is Tupper. I'm an alcoholic. The workshop title is Letting Go of Unhealthy Fears. I'm gonna begin with a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He who is not every day conquering some fear has not learned the secret of life. Hello everyone and welcome to our workshop on letting go of unhealthy fears. The reason we have these workshops is to work on the underlying issues behind alcoholism. If alcohol was a problem, most of us would be cured by now. Alcohol is but a symptom. Please let's all start together with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We're happy to have you here making this investment in your sobriety. You're making a huge deposit into your IRA. That's your individual recovery account. By being here and participating, keep making these deposits no matter how small, because one day, you may have a situation that will require you to make a huge withdrawal and you don't want your IRA to be depleted. You could be watching ESPN and waiting for the games to begin, cutting the grass, out shopping, or binge watching on Netflix. We will be using both AA conference approved literature and non-AA conference approved literature. Just because something is not AA conference approved does not mean it is disapproved by the AA conference. The Bible is not conference approved. The chips and medallions are not conference approved. The newspaper is not conference approved. Do yourself a favor and don't put restrictions on your sobriety. Oft times, the ties that bind us are more mental than physical. Here's an example. In India, one method of training elephants is to tie a baby elephant to a tree with a thick, heavy chain, thereby severely restricting its movement and almost immobilizing it. After a long time of this treatment, all an elephant handler has to do is to tie a rope around the elephant and put a stake in the ground to keep an elephant in place. The elephant is so conditioned to thinking that it is unable to move that some of them have been found dead in place after a fire. All the elephant had to do was try to move and it would have escaped the fire, but it thought it was still chained to a tree. By letting go of unhealthy and irrational fears, you will be freeing yourself from what's keeping you from being happily and usefully whole. From the 12 and 12 on page 15, quote, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. You will also be breaking the ties that bind you and keep you from growing. What is a normal fear in comparison to an irrational one? Most of us are fearful in situations that pose a real threat to our health and safety and our automatic fight or flight response kicks in. This is perfectly normal. But when the threat is non-existent or exaggerated, our fear can usually be classed as irrational. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the workshop. Please save your questions till then. Don't listen to anyone who tells you that there is no such thing as healthy fears. Healthy fears keep us alive and well, healthy. There's re there really is such a thing as healthy fear. For example, a very healthy fear walking is walking down a dark alley at midnight. I have a morbid fear of alcohol in my system. I'm not scared of alcohol in a container. However, fear should not be allowed to run rampant through our lives so that it becomes such a devastating factor that it produces failure. The problem is not getting rid of fear, but using it properly. Someone has said that the basis of action should be love and not fear. Theoretically, that's true, but in practice, it does not work out that way. There are legitimate fears. Fear of ignorance causes you to seek an education. Fear of poverty makes you work. Fear of disease motivates you to practice healthy and sanitary living. Fear of losing your job will inspire you to show up on time and do the best you know how to do. Fear of failing a class will drive a student to spend extra time in the books. Fear of losing our family inspires us to be faithful to them, work hard for them, and show them love on a daily basis. Many people in AA like to use the acrostic F-E-A-R for, quote, 
false evidence appearing real. However, if the evidence is real, we should certainly have some healthy fear. There's real fear in walking across the busy street without going to the corner where the lights are arranged for that purpose. There's legitimate fear in driving your car at excessive speed under any conditions, but particularly where the visibility is poor or the streets are slippery. We must learn to distinguish those helpful fears from the harmful one. When you can do that, fear is a friend. Until you learn to do it, however, fear can be an enemy. I am here to tell you that courage is not the absence of fear. It's okay and only human to have faith and fear simultaneously. On 9-11, every one of the first responders was scared, but they ran towards the burning buildings. Some will say, why have fear if you have faith? Again, I say that as a human being, you can have both faith and fear at the same time. The thing is not to let fear paralyze you. What does our literature say about fear? From the big book, page 62, selfishness equals self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a, bit, a position to be hurt. From the big book on page 68, quote, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. Also from the big book on page 68, we ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. From the big book, page 73, he is under constant fear and tension. That makes for more drinking. From page 84, fear of people, of economic insecurity will leave us. From pa same page, 84, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. From page 104, we have a long we have had long rendezvous with hurt, cry, frustration, self-pity, misunderstanding, and fear. From page 145, the greatest enemies of us alcoholics are resentment, jealousy, envy, frustration, and fear. Wherever men are gathered together in business, there will be rivalries and arising out of these a certain amount of office politics. From the 12 and 12, page 49, so when AA suggests a fearless moral inventory, it must seem to every newcomer that more is being asked of him than he can do. Both his pride and his fear beat him back every time he tries to look within himself. Pride says, you need not pass this way, and fear says, you dare not look. From the 12 and 12 on page 51, did fear and inferiority about my fitness for my job destroy my confidence and fill me with conflict. Every active alcoholic's worst nightmare, quote, the fear of running out of liquor. Are only alcoholics fearful? Please don't think that only alcoholics are fearful. Fear is a natural, powerful, primitive human emotion. It involves a universal biochemical response as well as a highly individual emotional response. Every human being has some fear that drives or debilitates them. Again, it's all about having the fear, but going forward anyway. It was only normal to be a bit fearful and apprehensive when you first started coming to AA meetings. Fear of the unknown is normal. I'll bet dollars to donuts that most people are fearful when they start the 12 steps, especially steps four and five and steps eight and nine. They cannot and do not let those fears stop them from taking the steps. Rational versus irrational fear, determining the effects of both fears. Now, the following is written by Andrew Walden on April 8th, 2019. Fear is very common, and anyone who says they aren't afraid of anything is probably lying to you or to themselves. I'm afraid of frogs. Seeing pictures of them make me shudder, or seeing one near me can make me panic. 
I'm also afraid of failing. I've built a reputation for being successful in school, into my career. And the thought of people seeing me fail either pushes me to do better or crash into a bundle of nerves. The point is, each of us have our own fears, rational fears and irrational phobias, and how we handle our reaction towards it. While your emotions are valid, it is important to recognize fears that are real and likely to occur at the right time for the right reason, and fears that are a bit out of touch with reality and only likely to cripple a person physically and mentally. These are the rational and irrational fears. In this article, we delve into psychology to tell the difference between rational and irrational fears, the difference between the two, and how either can affect your physical and mental health. If you believe you have a mental condition that hinders your ability to think rationally, seek counseling or psychiatric help to be diagnosed and given the appropriate treatment. Differentiating rational and irrational fear. The main differences between rational and irrational fear involve two factors. The first, the likelihood and logic of your fear coming to fruition and your body's reaction towards the fear. And by determining whether or not your fear is rational or irrational, it can help you to take a step further towards facing these fears head on. This is rational fears. Calling rational fears realistic fears may be true, but it's not accurate if you're comparing it with irrational fears. It's possible to be afraid of water in both cases, but if you're on a rickety boat in the middle of an ocean and get caught in the storm, your fear of drowning is rational. But if you are in the shower, and are afraid to turn on the water because you're afraid of drowning, then that becomes an irrational fear. A rational fear is one where your fear is something that can harm you or someone you care about. If you're afraid when your kids play outside because you live on a busy street, the fear is rational because they're likely to get hurt if they're not careful or a driver doesn't see them until it's too late. Here are some examples of rational fears. Number one, Fear of getting stuck in an elevator while riding a very old unit. Number two, losing your home because you haven't been paying your bills and rent for a while. Number three, your neighbor's loud and aggressive dog startles you when it barks. Number four, getting attacked by a bear while hunting in a bear-filled forest. Number five, failing to be accepted at the only college you applied to. Human nature has an instinct for survival. So when we see or feel something that triggers our fear, that translates to a physical or mental response. It is a logical fear with a presence that rationally triggers the fear. Whether or not you admit it, your body can sense danger and makes you feel fear. And the reaction to your body and mind says how well you react to those fears. Now let's talk about irrational fears. The same fears mentioned above can still be an irrational fear if the context or the reason for fear is highly unlikely. It's a rational fear to be afraid of getting attacked by a wild bear if you're in a forest with bears, but if you're afraid of bears and live in a penthouse in the middle of the city and don't want to go out of your building because you're afraid of that very same bear might attack you, that becomes an irrational fear. Irrational fears aren't just the absurd fears, what separates these fears from rational fears is that the amount of fear or reaction you have is exaggerated. So what you fear is highly likely to be harmless or has a low risk of occurring. Some examples include, number one, fear of clowns in a children's party. Number two, losing your home because an earthquake will swallow your home whole. Number three, your neighbor's loud cat can rip you to shreds. Cat scratches can hurt, but gosh, thinking a regular sized domestic cat can kill you is exaggerating the fear that is unlikely to happen. Number four, thinking your whole life is over because you failed a test. It's easy to distinguish rational and irrational fears as separate when we use exaggerated examples such as these. But at times the idea of splitting fears as rational or irrational may not always be accurate. There's a fine line between the two. Let's say, for example, your parent or someone you love is diagnosed with a fatal disease. 
They can die within the next week or they may die in 10 years. Doctors can't say. The fear for your loved one is rational because the risk of death is there. But at the same time, it's a given fact that everyone is eventually going to die at some point. So it's irrational to fear for your loved one's death because we can't deny the inevitable. Or take the fear of failing at work or school. You work hard to excel, but if you see a sudden decrease in your grade, it's rational to fear it will affect your grades. But at the same time, in the great, greater scheme of things, your grade for one term of school or a quarter of work year won't really make a big bump in your life. So it's also an irrational fear. The truth is that sometimes a fear is both or neither irrational nor irrational fear. If what you fear only has a chance of appearing, even if it is logical, it still falls under the definition of both rational and irrational fears. Some fears can be labeled as specifically rational or irrational, but at times it's difficult to differentiate the two. In truth, both fears are valid, especially when they have the same physical and mental effects on your body. The important difference is whether or not your fears drastically affect the way you live. So what happens when you're afraid? I mentioned earlier in this reading that the survival part of our early human instinct is still a part of our senses, and it's true for both rational and irrational fears. These are the physical and mental effects of your fears, of your fear. Physical effects first. Fear is a form of stress. When your body senses that you are scared or stressed, it releases cortisol, a steroid home hormone that comes from your adrenal glands. Cortisol flows through your blood to the different parts of your body, preparing several organs for what is known as the fight or flight response. In the early days, this cortisol was particularly life-saving. When cavemen saw a wild animal, like a lion, for example, they feared for their lives, causing stress, which then triggered the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. Their flight or fight response, therefore, is to choose to either run away or fight back. Cortisol prepares your body for either. Your heart rate increases, so there is more oxygen in your muscles and brain, preventing you from fatigue. Your lungs breathe fact faster to absorb more oxygen. Your eyes see better. While unnecessary body systems like your digestive, urinary, and reproductive systems temporarily slow down to focus your energy with the stressor at hand. Naturally, after you choose to fight or flight and you're far away from the danger, your body will slowly return back to normal. Today, now that we aren't constantly being hunted down by lions, the fight or flight response now has to deal with both physical and mental stressors. Some fears, Especially rational fears can be dealt with because you can face the fear head on and then your body returns to normal. However, when you're dealing with both rational and irrational fears, the idea of facing your fear trigger is much more complex, which could lead to anxiety, which could also lead to other mental conditions. Physically, when you can't deal with your fears or you are always afraid, your body will continue to release cortisol putting your body in a long-term state of flight or fight. Your body is meant to return to its normal state after this response. So when exposed to cortisol for long periods of time, your body can have long-term effects, including diarrhea, nausea, colds, high blood pressure, migraines, asthma, and heart attacks. There are also mental effects. When you can't really determine the fear in your body's response to it, you begin to develop anxiety. That is the constant feeling of being worried that something bad is going to happen. In worst cases, anxiety can affect your everyday life, your hobbies, or even your sleeping pattern because your body is always on edge. Anxiety has often been linked with depression and other mental conditions. Some people may continue to function even with mental disorders, but if they don't address their fear and the effects, it could have a long-term effects on your health. Let's talk about treatment. The best treatment is to face your fears while it is still a mild fear. It's okay to recognize fear and it's okay to be afraid. What's not okay is letting your anxiety and fear dictate how you run your life. 
In some cases, people with agoraphobia, which is the fear of feeling unsafe in public or private spaces, never set foot out of their homes because they feel that they're not safe anywhere. As a result, they develop depression and anxiety. Depression because their life is hindered and limited to the corners of their home and anxiety because they're always afraid of the outside world. In severe cases, when these fears are taking over your body, it is necessary to seek medical attention. A psychologist may help counsel you regarding your fears, while a psychiatrist can also do that as well as provide you with medicine to control your anxiety and other mental conditions. Whether you have rational or irrational fear, if you react to it physically or mentally, it is necessary to face these fears head on. If you feel like your fear is hindering the way you want to live, talk to a psychiatrist that can talk you through your anxieties, give you appropriate medicine, and provide you with suggestions on how to help you conquer your fears. Rational versus irrational fear, determining the effects of both fears by Andrew Walden, also written on April 8th, 2019. Okay. I'm gonna be reading now the top 50 most common phobias. I won't be reading all of them and I'm gonna shorten up some of the descriptions of them. Um, if you're reading with me, you can choose to read them all later. So phobias are distressing and disorienting emotional responses to real and imaginary situations or objects. They are conditioned by faulty generalizations and learning. <clears throat> and the consequence is irrational and involuntary fear. To the sufferer, a phobia can seem insufferable and unbearable to eat or even life-threatening, while others might find these uncanny un and unusual phobias quite fascinating. Today, let's discuss some of the most common phobias in the world. So be prepared to be surprised and startled. First, let's consider the top five phobias of all time. Glossophobia. Well, that's the fear of public speaking, also known as glossophobia. It tops the list as one of the most common phobias in the world. Uh, I'm going to move through this. A glossophobic person is unable to control the overwhelming nervousness and may have a nervous breakdown whenever confronted with such a public speaking engagement. Glossophobia can be directly caused through a related trauma or stress. Almost all the glossophobic people are distressed about being embarrassed in front of the public. It can be resulting from any such previous distressful event that happened during public speaking in public. Number two is thanatophobia. Thanatophobia is an extreme and irrational fear of death. While it would be reasonable to say that most people fear death, at least somewhat, people with thanatophobia fear death to the extent that the normal operation of their lives is severely hindered. A thanatophobic may be so afraid of the prospect of death that he or she refuses to leave home or becomes unreasonably hostile or avoidant when the subject of death is discussed. Number three, acrophobia. Acrophobia is an extreme or irrational fear of heights. Acrophobia can cause panic attacks and keep the person from leading a fulfilling personal and professional life. Typical symptoms include shortness of breath, rapid breathing, irregular heartbeat, sweating, nausea, and overall feelings of dread. Acrophobia can be dangerous, as in situations where the person has a panic attack in a high place and becomes too agitated to get themselves down safely. The most widely accepted explanation is that acrophobia stems from the natural fear of falling and being injured or killed. A phobia occurs when fear is taken to an extreme, due possibly to unintentional learning, generalization of the fear response, or the result of a traumatic experience. The next on the top list is claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is the irrational fear of combined spaces or enclosed spaces. It's normal to fear being trapped when there's a genuine threat, but people with claustrophobia become fearful in situations where there's no obvious or realistic danger. They'll go out of their way to avoid confined spaces such as lifts, tunnels, tube trains, and public toilets. However, avoiding these places can reinforce the fear. Like other fears and phobias, claustrophobia is created 
by the unconscious mind as some sort of defense mechanism. Lastly, on the top five list is aerophobia. Aerophobia, also known as aviophobia, is the fear of flying, either in airplanes or helicopters. The fear of flying is often associated with other fears and phobias. In some patients, aerophobia may be present along with claustrophobia. Many people feel mild anxiety before flights. However, in, in case of aerophobia, the anxiety takes on a more serious turn. Such people start avoiding vacations, put off business meetings that include flying. This can often have devastating effects on one's career and personal life. Okay, we have a long list here of some really fun words to pronounce, um, and I'm gonna leave most of them to you. We'll only read a few of these phobias to give you an idea. There is the link in the chat to access this at your leisure. I will let you know if any of you have a fear of long words, that fear is hippopotamonstro equipped aliophobia. I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, but I've been practicing that word. So at the top of the list of common phobias, we have arachnophobia, fear of spiders, nyctophobia, fear of darkness, social phobia, a fear of social situations, agoraphobia, fear of open or crowded spaces, astrophobia, fear of thunder and lightning, also known as brontophobia, which I think is a fear of some sort of dinosaur. Mysophobia is a fear of germs. Guys, I can go on and on and on. And if you scroll down, you will once again see if you're afraid of long words, there's that word, hippopot hell, hippopotamonstro equipped aliophobia. It's a great word. And I'm just scrolling all the way down slowly. I presume you're doing the same thing. I think all of us need to practice all of these words and we'll have a, a meeting about it. All right, what you can do about fear. You can also apply a psychological tool called sublimation. We all experience unwanted impulses or urges from time to time. How we deal with those feelings, however, can mean the difference between acceptable or unacceptable behaviors. You can use fear, anger, and other emotions or character defects to your advantage. Some people in your home group don't think you can stay sober. Use that anger and show them that you can stay sober and be the best version of yourself. It doesn't matter what helps you to get and stay sober initially because eventually you will be staying sober for yourself. Acting on these urges is the wrong way in the wrong way can be inappropriate. So finding ways to deal with such desires is critical. One way that people deal with such urges through a, through a process that is known in psychology as sublimation. Through sublimation, people are able to transform unwanted impulses into something that is less harmful and often even helpful. So how does sublimation work? Consider what might happen if you are overcome with anger. An emotional blow up is one way of dealing with these feelings, but such as expressions of emotion can be harmful. For instance, you might find yourself with damaged relationships and a reputation as a hothead. Rather than fly off in a fit of rage, what if you channel those angry emotions into some type of physical activity, such as cleaning your house? You might spend a few hours angrily scrubbing down your kitchen and bathrooms. Once your feelings of frustration eventually subside, well, gosh, you are left with a positive result, a sparkling clean house. This is one example of how sublimation can transform negative impulses into behaviors that are less damaging and even productive. The bottom line is that you are not powerless if you have a higher power of your understanding. You are not powerless over your fears. You can do something about your fears if they prevent you from being happily and usefully whole. Prayer and meditation are also great ways to help you deal with almost any fear. You also may not have to overcome your fear in one day. Baby steps might be what the doctor ordered in many cases. So guys, get out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid of faking it till you make it. It will be uncomfortable as heck, but try, do it anyway. Um, as you all well know, you can review this on a podcast. It'll be posted in uh, a few days. Okay. Um, 
We have lots of time before the next meeting. Um, and so we're going to open this meeting up to questions and answers. Um, you'll be given one minute to ask, uh, or our questions will come in, and then we're gonna ask people to respond with any answers they have, keeping questions brief and to the point. The same is, thing is gonna be true with answers or your experience, strength, and hope responses. Please, brief and to the point of the question. One minute for each question, one minute for each chair, uh, each share. And uh, let me click over here. So I'm gonna ask you uh, all to feel free to come on in and share with any questions you may have, have on today's reading on unhealthy fears. Uh, perhaps just raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have a question, please. Nobody has any fears. You did great, Tupper. Well, thank you. If we've resolved everyone's issues, then we can just, all right, uh, Peter, come on in. I'm asking you to unmute. Hey, everyone, uh, Peter, alcoholic addict. Um, I guess my biggest fear, which is my barrier to my sobriety is um, fear of like reaching out. And that's underlying because I'm, I'm fair, I'm fair of the unknown. So how do people, you know, reach out for help? You know, I've heard, you know, we have the list just to just, just text a phone number. But honestly, that is just so hard for me for reaching out. So I don't know if anybody has any advice on how to reach out. Um, that would be great, you know, reaching out and admitting that I need help is really difficult for me. Thanks, Peter. So the question is, um, there's a fear of reaching out. Um, Patricia, I'm going to unmute. Oh, you have an answer. Um, okay, so John, I'm going to ask you to come on in. Yeah, John Alcoholic. Feel the fear, but do it anyway. You know, feel the fear, but do it. Because this is life and death. This is life and death. Uh, you know, actually, a fear that should go on there is the fear of uh, doctors or fear of going to the doctor, or fear of hospitals. And I don't know why that, well, it, maybe it is on there. Uh, but feel the fear and do it anyway, because uh, this is life and death. That, that's it. Thank you. Mark, come on in a response to that. Yeah, my name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, when I first did my my first four step, um, it was pretty. Uh, you know, I couldn't I couldn't think of all the things. I, you know, I was still messed up in the head and all. But I, I did my second four step, and I did a I did much better. But there was two resentments. Um, you know, the these people I had to call, they just happened to both be female. And uh, one was for one reason, one was for financial reason. And uh, I just didn't want to do it. I was just, you know, I was scared. I, I took care of everything in the four step except these two. They lasted for about a year. And I just got up. Please. Hello? 20 seconds. I just... I just got up one day and said, screw it, and called them both. And uh, both were like, you know, it, it was no problem and, and, and all. And, you know, after that, I just felt that, you know, if you got to do something, you just j jump out and talk to somebody. And uh, it's not that bad. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Gemma, another uh, response to the question? Yeah. My first sponsors were a couple in AA, and he used to tell me, your, your thumb weighs 500 pounds. He said, you get a list of five to seven people in the program, and he said, you just got to lift that thumb and just let it drop on the go on your phone, and you just call one person a day, call a different person every day until you get used to it. Just do it. Thanks, Gemma. Patricia, um, another response. Hi. Hi, I'm Patricia. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks so much for this. Um, I'm really enjoying this. Um, yeah, just practice. 
a little out of time, um, but it leads me, like I, I raised my hand because I have a question or a fear um, of failure, um, which also could be like fear of success. And so it just leaves me like just so paralyzed and I don't even want to try, but I kind of think it relates to um, my friend's um, question. Um, yeah, just fear of failure, but thanks so much. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, okay, we may have two questions here. Jackson, come on in. Hey, um, I have more of a question, uh, kind of about like what y'all did, because I agree with whoever spoke last words. Like, I have a fear of, well, actually, I feel like I have more of a fear, fear of success and a fear of failure. I feel like it's just an acceptable, like an accepted or acceptable thing for me to fail. And so I'll put myself in there because I'm so scared of succeeding a lot of times. And then not only that, but um, I have a genuine fear of intimacy, like embedded deep down within me. And it's kind of been getting in the way of me progressing through my like sobriety and being there for other people that I care about. So as someone in like the early couple of months, I was wondering what are some tools and things that y'all did to kind of help you get through those things? Please. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, let's, I'm gonna keep it to the question that was posed by Patricia and also by Jackson. This is um, responses please to how you may have handled fear of success slash failure. Joe, come on in. Uh, so, so if you have a question right now, please lower your hand. Uh, wait till we answer the two previous questions. Joe, do you have a question or do you have a response? I have a response, John. Good morning, Zoo Crew. I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. And um, <clears throat> I had a very big fear of public speaking for a long time. And, you know, just putting myself in service here and, and being in front of a hundred people made it so much easier for me to get in front of my Alano and speak in front of them. I just pictured it as my family. And I also love to self-sabotage and I'm afraid of success. And, you know, I just have to recognize when my behaviors are starting to get, you know, to get to that point where I, where I am starting to, you know, Get into those bad behaviors. Seconds, Thank you, Sarah, and and recognize what I'm doing, and just being more aware of what you're doing. So, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe. John, a comment. Yeah, John, alcoholic. Uh, I got sober a month before my 22nd birthday. I was not rehabilitated. I, I was habilitated. Everything I learned is through Alcoholics Anonymous. And everything I did, everything I did for my first five years was out of my comfort zone. Uh, I, I read tons of books, uh, you know, outside of AA on how to deal with, you know, public speaking. I went to Toastmasters to learn public speaking. I read tons of books on dealing with fear, tons of books on, uh, you know, back then in the 80s, uh, uh, transactional analysis was the thing. Uh, I'm okay, you're okay. When I say no, I feel guilty. So I was a reader. I am a reader. All right, all right thank you. I was a reader. I am a reader still. Uh, you know, read, read, read stuff. And especially now, you, you have YouTube uh, to help you deal with these fears. Uh, but yeah, you, you can overcome that. If I can do it, you can do it. Definitely out of my comfort zone, but I did it. Thank you. Nicole, another comment on fear of failure or success? Yeah, I'm Nicole, I'm alcoholic. Uh, fear of failure, fear, fear of success. I think for myself, um, I'm more fearful of success. Um, just the unknown. Uh, failure is probably more, more comfortable for me because it's, you know, when I was out actively addicting, active, actively using that, you know, failure was happening all the time. I was comfortable in that. It's like John said, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, so being comfortable, being uncomfortable. So I look at that as a success. If I can, if I can, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, um, then I'm moving forward. 
I'm taking action, I'm moving forward, I'm getting through to the other side. And I just need to, for me, I just hold on to that hope um, that, you know, I'm moving forward. 20 I'm seconds, please. Constantly moving forward. Thanks, sir. And, um, and as long as I'm being my, my true authentic self and approaching any one of these fears or obstacles, I want to call them obstacles instead of success or failures. But as long as I'm, I'm being my true authentic self, then I'm going to be successful. And that's all I have to share. Thanks, Tupper. Great job. Okay. There's two more hands up. These will both be the last comments on fear of success slash failure. Michael, please come in. You have to unmute, Michael. Michael, can you hear me? You have not unmuted yet. I can hear you just fine now. I'm, I apologize. Okay. I may have mentioned this is my first time participating. Um, I watched a lot of it. But, but anyway, um, somebody gave me some great advice about talking to a group. And that was just look at everybody's forehead because it looks like you're looking at them, but it's a lot easier to look at them with their, in their forehead instead of their eyes, even though they may think you're looking right at them because everybody's afraid to talk in public. And that's, you know, I'm in education. Um, I still do it now. I go out and talk to groups. 20 seconds, please. Thank you. And that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you, Michael. Jen, come on in. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen and I'm an alcoholic. So for me, my fear protects my ego. And what I have to do is recognize when that's happening. And the only way to do that for me is to do the steps and recognize which character defects come out. And for me, fear was a big one. If my ego would be fed, if I was super successful. So the fear of failure was really detrimental to me. And also I had a fear of being successful because what if that all went away? And that would also be tied to my ego. So for me, once I check my ego and make sure that that is in place, um, my fears started to go away. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Um, we're done with that question. Um, Cece, do you have another question for the group? Is that right? I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, Cece, alcoholic. Yeah, it's a question. Um, I have six months sobriety and I have a fear of being around people that trigger me to the point that I avoid them. Um, is, that, is that an unhealthy fear or is that is that just normal in early sobriety? Thank you. Okay, um, these will be responses to the question posed by CC. Nicole, come on in, please. Nicole, alcoholic. Um, I think you. Um, I would suggest when I'm feeling when I have felt that, uh, it, I would have to look at my spiritual spiritual fitness, and I would have to dig deep there. Um, uh, the obsession has been lifted for me. I have no fear being around alcohol. I think it's, it's almost normal though, to recognize it, recognize that fear of, um, you know, that it is there, but, um, it doesn't worry me. I, I recognize that it's there, but, um, that alcohol is there, but that's it. I move on. It's, it, it means nothing to me anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, a bottle of water. So, um, I think once your spiritual fitness is seconds, really, please. really in line and it's grounded, that foundation is built, you will be able to be around alcohol, see it, whatever, and it's not going to affect you at all. That's all I got. Thanks, Tupper. Thanks, Nicole. John, come on in. Hey, everybody, John, alcoholic. Uh, so the Living Sober book is a great book. Uh, I'll put a link to in the chat to read Living Sober, but I would also suggest uh, buying a copy of that book 
uh, it'll answer many questions that newcomers and not so newcomers will have about uh, sobriety. Uh, once you've taken the steps and that obsession is gone, you can go anywhere, anytime, do anything. Again, I got sober young. I used to go to clubs. I used to go to bars. And this is me. I had no problem. This is me. Um, you know, yeah, so get a sponsor, take the steps. And once you've changed, once, you ha once you've had that psychic please. change, all right, thank you. You won't have to worry about uh, alcohol anymore. We have it in the house. You know, down here in Florida, the freaking stuff is in the gas station. It's at the supermarket. I don't, it's not, alcohol is not my problem anymore. It never was my problem. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Two more hands up in response to the question posed. Barbara, Joe, come on in. Yeah, I uh, wanted to respond. Seems like we sort of skipped over Jackson's question about intimacy. And, yeah, I was uh, going to get back to that. Okay, I'm sorry. I just yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. No Thanks. Yeah, we'll get back to that um, right after Mark. So, Mark, come on in. All right. Thank you. Mark, come on in. Asking you to unmute. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know the name of that book, John, you said. John, that was just speaking. Uh, ask, ask it in the chat. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do a quick response to the question posed about um, toxic relationships. Uh, based on what I read today, it seems like that fear is kind of a little bit bounded in a rational fear and irrational and you know working through that uh, I think we all know that being around toxic people sometimes is not the healthiest place to be but it's making choices around what you do with it when you're around toxic people and what you do with the fear when you're not around them okay now the next oh John come on in yeah I guess to ask to address the toxic question uh we have a podcast. Uh, I, actually, I did. I think just last month we did a podcast on dealing with yeah. toxic people in your life. Yeah. Uh, so check out our podcast, and again, read some books on uh, these different topics. They will help so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question posed was um, fear of intimacy and what what people think can be done or uh, what choices they've made in the past. So um, that's a question out there for the group. Please raise your hand for answers. Barbara Joe, did you want to come in and answer? Talk about that one. Well, um, it's pretty much the same. I'm Barbara now, I'm an alcoholic and recovering addict. Um, uh, well, what people are saying about feel, feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. I think the intimacy, you know, it's one just asking the question and each time that I have a fear or I'm thinking something, you no know, one with an individual, each time, especially within the program where it feels safe, I can say something to a sponsor and talk about what's really going on. All of that is, is practice and knowing that I can say what's true for, for me and uh, still be accepted. Seconds, not be, please. Thanks, not be rejected. You know, and feel that, okay, well, it's safe to, it's safe to be seen. And like you said about toxic people, you know, find people where it's safe to be seen. So that's what works with me and um, finding a few special people I can really trust practicing that with. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Jen, come on in, please. Hi, everyone. Jen, still an alcoholic. So for the intimacy thing, um, once I did my step four and five, and really figured out that I really had severe trust issues. Um, I was able to work on that and start healing. And I found the root of where my trust issues started. So once I was able to deal with that, let that go, 
I was able to start and build meaningful, intimate relationships with people, whether it be just really good friends or whether it be being in another relationship. And to me, that was so important and it was so freeing. So um, I recommend definitely doing good step four and five and a good sex inventory as well. Um, like it says in the book. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Jen. Nicole, come on in, please. Nicole, alcoholic. Um, the intimacy one, I think I, st I struggled a little bit with that about being vulnerable, um, which is somewhat the same moving forward. So I did um, somewhat like Jen said, you know, I feel like you have to work, uh, you know, those, the step four, you, you really have to be thorough with it to be able to move forward and feel good, uh, feel good inside yourself um, and then have the be able to move forward and have the confidence to be and the openness to be vulnerable um, and, and move forward. Uh, I think once you've done that, you come to a place of acceptance. Um, you've accepted your past, you're you know, accepting seconds, where you are uh, moving forward. And um, yeah, you, you, you have that confidence to be more vulnerable and open up um, in, in your relationships moving forward. So I think that really helps. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. John, come on in, please. Yeah, John, alcoholic. Uh, so I, I went through a divorce in 2001. And after my divorce, uh, I had 19, 20 years at the time. Uh, to get back into the dating world, again, I read tons of books on how to date. I didn't know how to date. I, I Thank God I was a reader. I am a reader. It, there's... <laughs> My favorite word, there, there, there's a plethora of information out there on these topics, you know, and we didn't have YouTube back then. Check out YouTube on how to, uh, you know, how to do these things. I, I had, like I said, I wasn't rehabilitated. I was habilitated. I had to learn these things. Um, so, yeah, read, 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 and check out YouTube. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Um, just gonna keep this open. If there are any other pressing questions that you, anyone would like to pose here for the group to respond to. All right, well, thank you all for joining this podcast. Um, I'm gonna end the meeting now with a brief moment of silence for those who are in need. And then we're going to follow that together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everybody can unmute and tell uh, Topper how good a job you did. Great job, Great Topper. Job, Topper. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. I think there's also a, a new fear. I'm going to have to come up with a definition. It's fear of the proper pronunciation of the word plethora. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You, you just said it. Well that, that, that's you it. Said it. Right. <laughs> well done. You knocked out the fear of long words and you're struggling with plethora, huh? Yeah.